He said, oh, I can't stand going anywhere at this hour of the day. I just want to get, go home and get in my pajamas. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, the, the, I look forward to the day that I am willing to read in my pajamas. <laughs> Not today. Okay, so um, as you know, my, this novel that I'm going to read from, I was a little tempted to read something different today because just today I handed in a draft of a new novel to my agent. We know it so. But I decided, no, read the novel that's coming out. Um, okay, so you know what it's about. It's about this meteorologist who discovers she has the power to change the weather. Um, she's a dropout from a PhD program in atmospheric sciences at MIT. So as a scientist, it takes her a while to really believe that she has this power. Um, the section I'm going to read to you um, takes place when she's finally accepted that she really can affect the weather, but she hasn't actually told anyone, and she's wondering how she might actually put this skill to use. It's been a year of intense weather everywhere, um, but she's become focused in particular on the proliferation of tornadoes in the Midwest. Since high school, she's um, followed the work of a meteorologist named Vince Carmichael, who reports from Oklahoma City, and he's well known to be the most knowledgeable about tornadoes of anyone in the country. He's been able to predict their movement very accurately and has therefore saved many lives. And although Bronwyn, um, so Bronwyn, although she's never met him, regards him with um, very highly, and he's sort of a god and a mentor. And so she's made contact with him at this point um, with the idea that she might be able to work out something with him. It's not quite clear, but that she'll tell him that she has this skill and that they'll maybe be able to work out a, a kind of a collaboration. Okay, so the section begins as she's driving from Wichita to Oklahoma City, where he is. The landscape on either side of the road is a lesson in geometry with its squared off fields, its round hay bales, its ruler straight roads. Evidence of devastation appears unexpectedly. Road signs crashed and crumpled, uprooted trees with tumorous root balls exposed, barns sheared to half their height. In one place, just after she has seen a sign for a town named Hope, there's a pile of sheetrock and shingles, pipes and wires, and a pink toilet turned on its side as if napping. The mid-level alto cumulus are metallic blue with the defining crenellated tops of Castellanus clouds, announcing unsettled weather ahead. The sun glows through them, turning the yellow fields beneath them gold. It feels as if she's in Dorothy's Kansas before the tornado arrived to sweep them off to Oz. She scans the horizon for a wall cloud, a tornado's precursor, but so, so far she sees nothing. At a rest stop, she stops, um, sn gets out, sniffs the air. The pavement is dark with recent rain, and humidity sticks to her face and arms, her, uh, face and arms with the tenacity of burrs. Beyond the restroom, fields stretch clear to the horizon. The sky here is huge, more dramatic than any she's ever seen, and full of bravado. It gulps everything, dwarfing the landscape beneath. A bout of loneliness engulfs her. What is she doing here? Can she function in such an unfamiliar landscape? Is she imagining it, or is that really thunder growling in the distance? Goosebumps pepper her arms. She hears the whir of blood in her cheeks and neck. She doesn't trust any of the reports she's read from the National Weather Service. Vince will set her straight. By the way, she feels the weather in her body. This is part of the way she transforms it. Okay, this is the next day. The weather center is busy as a Hollywood set and infused with, if not a sense of alarm, at least a sense of focused attention and high purpose. Vince, back to Bronwyn, sits at the center of a semicircle of screens displaying maps, radar, Doppler, reports on the weather all over the country, into Canada and Mexico and across the Pacific. His minions work at stations in an outer ring, some on the phone, some gazing so fixedly at their screens they appear catatonic. 
Raised monitors throughout the room play a daytime drama currently being broadcast from another part of the station. To one side of all this activity is a stage from which, which Vince delivers his reports. The receptionist instructs Bronwyn to wait on the periphery. He'll be with you shortly, she tells Bronwyn before gliding off. Stay here. The din makes it hard to focus. People whiz by. On, on the daytime, on the TV, the daytime, a daytime drama, um, oh, on the TV, on the daytime drama, a, a woman sobs. A guy on the phone is ordering lunch. No mustard, I said, no mustard. On the far side of the room, someone yells, typhoon in the South China Sea. She waits, watching Vince. After several minutes, he turns to assess her, squinting a little and making a single culvert of his two exhausted eyes. Bronwyn smiles. A man on the daytime drama gasps. He's just been shot. Vince turns away, raising a single finger in her direction. Fire in Yosemite, someone shouts. After another 10 minutes, Vince rises, cardboard coffee cup in hand, and walks past her, nodding. Assuming this is her cue, she follows. Down a hallway, they march into a large brown office, walls covered with framed photographs of tornado-damaged landscapes, photos of supercells taken from space, award certificates, citations of excellence, man cave, brag chamber. Vince sits behind his desk into a chair that dwarfs him, and he leans back, regarding her with curiosity. She stands still, letting herself be examined while also regarding him back, trying to match the intensity of his gaze, her spine lifting and straightening with purpose. He's so much smaller and craggier in person, his face textured as a dry riverbed. Well, he says, I'm Bronwyn, she says, Bronwyn Artaire. Yes, of course, have a seat. As I said in my email, I've been watching you since I was in high school. You're the reason I wanted to become a meteorologist. Vince's face relaxes and he laughs. You're not the first, but thank you. What can I do for you? She probes his irises, tests the air. Yesterday's sky fills her vision, the metallic clouds, the rain-perfumed air, the immensity of it all. I felt I had to see you in person, person, she says closely, reaching for a rhythm. I know I have a lot to learn from you. You said you're from... It's suddenly clear he doesn't remember her email. He has no idea who she is, though they supposedly have an appointment. Originally New Jersey, but now I'm in New Hampshire. I do weather at WVOX out of Manchester. He chuckles. Ah, tame weather. You don't have weather like ours back there, do you? We have plenty of hurricanes and blizzards. The, that, the difference is you can see that weather coming for days. You know exactly what it's going to do. Sometimes. I'm guessing you're here to ask for a job. The question itself does not surprise her, but she wasn't prepared for it to arrive so soon. She wanted to compare notes first, tell him how she used to watch clouds as a child lying in the backyard and staring up, imagining herself drifting among them. If only his face were a cloud, she might rearrange, but it is immutable and deflecting. He's bolted in his seat like a heavy child on the seesaw, holding her up at his whim. She must shift the conversation's terms. Not a job, exactly, or at least not in the way you're thinking. He raises a single eyebrow, tips back his chair so it squeaks, and the sound releases something in her, and she takes the plunge, overriding doubt, looking first at him, then into the refuge of her lap, then at him again. She's here, after all. She came here for this. It's hard to explain exactly, but something's happened to me. I don't know how exactly or why, but I seem to be able to, clearing her throat, smiling to please, then consciously eradicating the smile, alter the weather. Vince frowns. The capillaries in the tips of her fingers twitch. Vince leans forward. Excuse me? She sees she has piqued his interest. She smiles, this time intent on pleasing. Yes, I know it sounds unusual, but I have a way. I generate an enormous... I've done this a number of times now, and yes? She rides the wave of his encouragement. I stopped an electrical storm in Mount Washington. I have witnesses. 
But that's only one thing I've done. I've also, she pauses. Hold on, hun, back up a minute. I'm trying to understand. Vince leans forward, his rutted chin in the lead. Did you really t just tell me you changed the weather? Well, his eyes spark, two little fireflies. She grins, sheepish and proud. Yes, she's never said this aloud, and it feels strange and boastful, but if she's going to confess this to anyone, Vince Carmichael is that person. Let's get our terms straight here. Weather, you're talking wind and rain, thunder and lightning, hail and snow, humidity and temperature. Are we on the same page here? Yes. This isn't a metaphor? No. <laughs> He nods, a long, slow up and down that resembles bowing. You said you stopped an electrical storm. What's your technique? It's hard to explain exactly. It's a matter of concentration. His attention on her is avid, unswerving. She is the force of the moment, the no tornado passing over his radar screen. Enlivened by his focus, she gestures, spreading arms and hands. I corral a lot of energy, and then it's almost as if I leave my body and become the weather itself. He holds up a palm. Wait a sec. I want some other people to hear this. He pokes his intercom. Kathy, can you send Rob and Earl in here? Thanks, son. He sits back, shaking his head, astounding. Finally, she's talking to the right person, the person she's wanted to talk to all along, someone who understands these forces, someone who watches them daily as she does. She wants to tell him about the river, the wedding, about her sense of attunement, but this is all so private and personal. She'd really rather explain it without anyone else present. I'd rather just tell you, she says, but it's so damn interesting. A guy is already standing at the door, someone Bronwyn saw on the set. His eyebrows are stuck in the raised po position of a genuflector. <laughs> you wanted me, he says. Yeah, Rob, have a seat. Next, a huge head appears around the doorframe. It floats, seemingly unattached to a body, sporting thick, rimless glasses and a lazy, glistening lower lip. Vince beckons flamboyantly, impatiently. Hey, Earl, come in. You gotta hear this. Earl's full body comes into view, view and fills the doorframe. He stands well over six feet, and he wears a clerical collar, a, a baseball cap, and green Converse sneakers. I'll get another chair, Vince says. No, no, I'm good, Earl says. He occupies a position against a bookshelf behind Rob. Vince leans forward and lays both his palm on, palms on the desk. Okay, Earl, Rob, this woman here, Ms. What did you say your name was? Artaire, Bronwyn Artaire. Guys, this is something big here. Ms. Arter says, well, go ahead, sweetheart, you tell them. Bronwyn winces at sweetheart, but decides not to make a point of it. Vince sits back, keeping his gaze on her as if she's his prized student. Bronwyn hesitates. She's always better than, with one person than in a big group. Go on, Vince urges. Okay, she recrosses her legs and clears her throat. I've always been really interested in weather since I was a kid. I used to study atmospheric sciences at MIT, but now I'm a meteorologist at a station in New Hampshire. And recently, I've come to realize that I have the capacity to alter the weather, you know, stop storms and so forth. She pauses to let them absorb what she said, examining their faces, but finding no visible reaction other than a slight widening of Rob's eyes. She stopped a thunderstorm on Mount Washington. Isn't that something, Rob, Vince says? Rob's gaze flicks from Vince to Bronwyn to Vince again. <coughs> yeah, I guess it is. You guess? You guess? Come on, Rob, grow some balls. This is big news, right, Earl? Earl's placid lake of a face remains untouched, and Vince does not press his point. We had something like this happen once before, Vince says. Remember that Native American gal, real short and wrinkled, white hair, from the Kiowa tribe or the Kickapoo? I don't remember, she was one of the elders anyway. She said she could get her spirits to call off the tornadoes if we agreed to stop using our cell phones. Not just here at the station, but all over Oklahoma. He rolls his eyes, yeah, right, that was really gonna happen. But this is different, right, Ms. Arter? No strings attached here. Bronwyn nods. Vince seems to want her to speak, but only so much. You and I could be a terrific team. I spot the tornadoes developing and you zap them. The old one-two punch. What do you think, Earl? Earl pauses. 
who pulls in his lower lip but holds to his poker face. Perhaps his effort, her efforts offend his religion. You know what I think, Vince continues? I think this is big enough that we should get on the horn to the president. You think so, Rob? Sure, I guess. We need to let him have, uh, no, we have a huge resource at the station here, a national treasure. Wait, Bronwyn says, things are happening way too fast. What president does he mean exactly? Surely not the US president. I wrote this before, you know who. She, she came here thinking this meeting would be private and under the radar, but she's lost ownership somewhere along the way. I don't really want, but Vince is already on the intercom, this time speaking through the receiver. Kathy, can you get the president on the line for me? Of course the president of the United States. Who do you think, the president of Estonia? He returns the receiver to its cradle. Bronwyn, panicked, looks at the other two men for help. Rob is staring into his lap where his interlaced hands form a fist. Earl wears an expression of ambiguous consternation. Vince relaxes back in his chair again. How long does it take to get the president on the phone? Maybe the call won't go through. Vince catches Earl's eye and winks. He turns, his, uh, he turns back to Bronwyn with a smile that does not, is not exactly team building. <laughs> Bronwyn has rarely felt so uncomfortable. If only she could control social situations as she controls the weather. Do you talk to the president often, Bronwyn asks. It's a lame question, possibly even insulting. Vince's smile beams on. <clears throat> Vince, Earl says. Shut up, Earl. See, I can say that to Earl because we go way back. High school buddies, Earl and me, right, Earl? Vince, Earl says again. Miss Artair. Every time I see a supercell building on that radar screen, I think how great it would be if I could stop that sucker. I have that wish at least once a week during tornado season. No, more, much more, hell, almost every day. Almost every day I wish I could control the weather. Who wouldn't want that? A perfect day for the beach? Bingo. Snow for skiing? Bring it on, ta-da. Everyone wants that kind of power. If I could order up the weather, I'd be raking in the bucks. Heck, I'd rule the world. He pauses, reveling in his contemplation of world power. But guess what? He leans forward, so again, his chest is, his chest is almost lying on the desk. I can't do that. And that Native American gal couldn't do it with her spirits. And you, Ms. Artaire, you sure as hell can't do it either. Oh, oh wait, let's not assume anything. Surely. You you know we're going to be slammed by another storm system in another 24 hours, give or take. Why don't you call off that system right now? He sits back in his chair, chuckling a little. Sure, he's called her bluff. Come on, we all know you can't do this stuff, stuff so talk, stop wasting my time. He reaches for the intercom again, not bothering with the receiver. Kathy, it's time to escort Ms. Artaire out. He mutters, showboating nut job shakes his head dolefully at Earl and consults his cell phone. Wind whooshes in her eardrums. He never put in a call to the president. He's been mocking her all along. Why was she so slow to see what he was doing? Earl saw and probably Rob did too. All these years she's admired this terrible, mean-spirited, close-minded man. The swanky, white-clad receptionist has materialized beside her and is tapping her shoulder. Okay, time to get out as if she expects Bronwyn to resist. For a cloud to form, particles must exist on which vapor can condense. Soot, salt, bacteria, a variety of particles encourage condensation. Anger, too, needs a surface on which to perch and grow its own version of hygrosp hygroscopic particles. She exits exits the station quietly swearing, anger at Vince curling around the residue of her former worship. She was stupid to have pinned her hopes on him. They have nothing in common. And he is not a nice man. He isn't even polite. <laughs>